When you came out of your black guy, you started slugging, so I had to put you to sleep again. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. We do have spoilers ahead. Today, on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on the film noir Lady in the Lake 1946. I want to shout out to Military History Guy for his comments on the bridges at Tokari 1954. Keep those comments and emails coming. Today's film has a 6.6 rating on imdb.com. On RottenTomatoes.com, the film has 60% on the tomato meter and 50% audience approval. Oh man, I give up. I'm taking a rocket to Mars. This ain't the best film noir, but it dang sure ain't that bad. It's got Audrey Totter making mean faces. That's enough by itself. On my ever-changing list of all film noirs, I am placing this movie at 49. The film is right in there with Mystery Street 1950 and Border Incident 1949. So I will say it is a very enjoyable watch and more than a little complicated. The real issue with Lady in the Lake 1946 is that director Robert Montgomery chose to use the camera as the protagonist. Or in other words, the majority of the film was shot as a point of view from Philip Marlowe's eyes, played by Robert Montgomery. This had the lead actor off camera most of the time. This led to Montgomery narrating the film, which many people hated. I didn't mind, as it is akin to reading a pulp novel. It also had the added effect of having Audrey Totter on the screen a lot of the times. She was great in this film, but was she a femme fatale? I'll talk about this more in the conclusions. Director Robert Montgomery got the idea from Delmar Davies, who planned to use it in limited scenes from Dark Passage 1947. It worked in Dark Passages because of its limited use. It was done in the film so the audience would not see Humphrey Bogart's face until after he had plastic surgery. New York Times film critic Bosley Crothers didn't care for the film or for the use of the subjective film technique. In a February 9, 1947 review, he said, quote, For one thing, the principal character has to talk too much in this film, unquote. He later said, quote, And then, to this frequent conversation from the camera, as it were, requires that the other characters talk directly to the audience most of the time. Even from such an attractive vis-a-vis -vis as Audrey Totter in this film, or from such disturbing antagonists as Jane Meadows and Lloyd Nolan portraying this attitude becomes a bit monotonous, unquote. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Robert Montgomery directed this film and played the lead, but not often seen, private detective Philip Marlowe. Montgomery was first covered in the exciting film noir Ride the Pink Horse, 1947. Audrey Totter plays the elusive Adrian Fromsett. This great actress was first covered in the boxing film noir The Setup, 1949. Was she a femme fatale? Lloyd Nolan was pretty good as police detective de Garment. He came off very well as the angry cop. Nolan was first covered in Dangerous to Know, 1938. Leon Ames played wealthy publisher and philanderer Darius Kingsby. This solid character actor was first covered in Battleground, 1949. Tom Tully played the tough-as-nails police Captain Kane. Tully was first covered as the tough-as-nails Navy captain in the Kane Mutiny 1954. Morse Ankrum played parent Eugene Grayson. Ankrum was first spoken about in Earth vs. the Flying Saucers 1956, where he had his brain melted by aliens. Kathleen Lockhart played the other parent, Mrs. Grayson. She was mentioned in A Christmas Carol 1938. Jane Meadows played Mildred Haviland. Meadows was born in China to American missionary parents in 1919. Her growing family returned to Connecticut in the 1930s. Meadows became interested in acting and later studied at the Stella Adler Studio of Acting. She made her Broadway debut in 1941. Meadows signed with MGM following World War II. Some of her earlier roles include Undercurrent 1946, Lady in the Lake 1946, Song of the Thin Man, 1947, Dark Delusion, 1947, The Luck of the Irish, 1948, Enchantment, 1948, David and Bathsheba, 1951, and The Fat Man, 1951. By the early 1950s, Meadows made a conscious decision to work on television. She was pretty successful in this medium. 
Meadows married funny man Steve Allen in 1954. She intentionally let her career take a backseat to her husband's. Meadows returned to film in the 1970s with such films as Norman Is That You, 1976, a gay-themed comedy with Red Fox, Murder by Numbers, 1990, playing Billy Crystal's mother in City Slickers, 1991, and in City Slickers 2, The Legend of Curly's Gold, 1994, and her final film role, The Story of Us, 1999. Meadows died in 2015 at the age of 94. Her younger sister was Audrey Meadows of The Honeymooners, 1955, where she was in danger of being sent to the moon. Dick Simmons played the role of ladies' friend Chris Lavery. Simmons was born in Minnesota in 1913, so naturally they cast him as a Southerner. Simmons attended the University of Minnesota, where he was athletic and did a little theater. In the 1930s, Simmons traveled around the world working on ships. He finally settled down in Los Angeles, obtaining a contract with MGM. He had a succession of minor roles in films like A Million to One, 1936, One Million B.C., 1940, as a shell person, and Sergeant York, 1941, as a random soldier. His best-known film is On an Island with You, 1948. On television, he was the lead in Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, 1955-1958. He had various roles on Death Valley Days from 1965 to 1969. Simmons died in 2003. Leela Leeds had a small role as the receptionist. However, since the movie was point of view, Marlowe spent some time looking at her every time she was around. Leeds was born in Dodge City, Kansas in 1928. Other sources say Iola, Kansas. At the age of 15, Leeds ran away to St. Louis before heading to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, Leeds attended acting school before signing a contract with MGM. Her early starter film roles include The Show Off, 1946, Lady in the Lake, 1946, Green Dolphin Street, 1947, and Moonrise, 1948. On August 31, 1948, Leeds was arrested with companion Robert Mitchum for possession of marijuana. Leeds served 60 days in jail, and it has been reported that she was introduced to heroin during her incarceration. Shortly after her release from jail, she was involved in a traffic accident, giving more negative press. While Robert Mitchum's career continued without a hitch, it was not so for the young actress. She made two more movies, The House Across the Street, 1949, and Wild Weed, 1949, a sort of a Reefer Madness 1938 replay. Leeds left Hollywood in 1949 and lived mainly in the Midwest. She married a few more times and had three children. These children were often in orphanages as their mother struggled with her drug addiction. In the 1970s, she was found in Los Angeles where she had studied religion and was working to help people at local missions. She never worked in Hollywood again and died in 1999 at the age of 71. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. This movie is set during the Christmas season and features seasonal hymns and decoration. In one of the few times he is seen in the film, Philip Marlowe, Robert Montgomery, sits with a gun in his hand and introduces himself as a private detective. He talks about the low pay for private investigators. He says the newspapers are full of details about the lady in the lake killing. But he says he is the only one that knows the truth and all the details. Before the case began, he decided to become a short story writer for pulp magazines. He tells that three days before Christmas, he received a letter from A. Fromsett asking him to come in so they could buy his story. Marlowe challenges the audience to try and solve the case before the end of the movie. The movie jumps back in time, and the point of view filming starts as Marlowe walks into the office where A. Fromsett works. The lovely receptionist, Leela Leeds, sends Marlowe into A. Fromsett's office. Behind the desk is A. Fromsett, Audrey Totter. You're here about some kind of a story, aren't you? Yeah. I got a letter about it from somebody named A. Fromsett. I'm A. Fromsett. Adrian Fromsett, to be precise. She plays coy about the story, but Marlowe points out that it's on her desk. Adrian Fromsett is dripping with honey as she talks about the story. The receptionist comes into the room, and the point of view is focused on her. Adrian snaps Marlowe's attention back and gives him his first face of the film. We didn't need dialogue. We had faces. Adrian says Darius Kingsby, Leon Ames, owns the company and she is his right hand. 
Marlowe realizes from the conversation that Adrian doesn't want his story and she only wants to hire him for a detective job. Adrian says Kingsby's wife has run away with another man. She wants Marlowe to find Crystal Kingsby, Ella Mort, without Mr. Kingsby knowing he is looking for her. Adrian says Kingsby intends to divorce his wife, but he needs to find her so she can be served. Marlowe insults Adrian and a small shouting match breaks out. Mr. Kingsby comes in and asks if he can do anything. Adrian introduces Marlowe as a writer and says the story is worth more than double the going rate. Kingsley looks like he's been shot when he hears Marlowe is a detective. They continue to go back and forth and Marlowe is shown in the mirror. Adrian invites Marlowe back to her place for a drink. When Adrian goes out of the room, Marlowe reads an El Paso telegram from Crystal, but her name is incorrectly spelled. The telegram reads that she is going to Mexico to divorce Kingsby and marry Chris Lavery. Adrian tells Marlowe that Crystal has been running around with Chris Lavery, Dick Simmons. He fires back that she could have just given him the telegram instead of leaving it out for him to find. Adrian says she has seen Lavery in town. She also says Crystal would not get divorced without a property settlement. Marlowe calls Adrian out for knowing Lavery. She gives Marlowe his address in Bay City. He asks to kiss her, then leaves her standing there with her eyes closed. She gives him a rough look. Marlowe thinks she wants to marry Kingsby, but has been having an affair with Lavery. Marlowe goes to Lavery's house in Bay City. Lavery is a fit man with a heavy southern drawl. Private detective. Well, I declare, you fellas going from door to door now? Shame business is so bad. I don't think I can use a private detective. Marlowe goes inside and asks where Crystal is. Lavery says he has never been to El Paso. Marlowe gets aggressive with Lavery. Lavery asks Marlowe for the time, and when Marlowe looks away, Lavery knocks him out. Marlowe wakes in a jail cell. Someone has wrecked his car and poured booze all over him. Police detective DeGarment, Lloyd Nolan, is telling the sergeant about Marlowe's crime. Marlowe is given his possessions back. DeGarment says Marlowe got rough and he had to beat him unconscious again. When you came out of your black guy, you started slugging, so I had to put you to sleep again. Marlowe is taken to the office of Captain Kane, Tom Tully. They read Marlowe the riot act about drunk driving. Marlowe says that Lavery hit him. Captain Kane reminds Marlowe not to work in his town without contacting him first. Marlowe returns to Adrian's office. He appears in the mirror as they both look at his black eye and lumps. Marlowe is upset that Lavery attacked him. He wants to quit the case but Adrian insists he continue to look for Crystal. Adrian tells Marlowe that Crystal was last seen at Little Fawn Lake, just beyond Arrowhead. She continues that there are three or four cabins and Kingsby owns one of them. While she writes a note to the caretaker, the receptionist comes in and we have another point of view session with her. Adrian insists that Marlowe go to the lake, although he clearly doesn't want to go there. The receptionist buzzes that Floyd Greer, Frank Orth, wants to talk to Kingsby about something at the lake. Adrian lets him come into the office. Greer will only talk to Kingsby about something that happened at the lake. Greer tells Kingsby that his caretaker is being held for murder after his wife, Muriel Chess, was found dead in the lake. On hearing the information, Adrian orders Marlowe to the lake, assuming that Crystal is the murderer. Marlowe is shown in present time talking about the case. He says he has seen the body and picked up some more information. The filming returns to point of view, and Marlowe arrives at Adrian's place at 4 a.m. She lets him inside, but gives him more faces. Marlowe says that Muriel Chess's real name was Mildred Haviland. Mildred married Chess because she was hiding from a tough cop. Mildred and Crystal fought over a man, who he later found out was Chris Lavery. Marlowe tries to quit again. He is shown in the mirror as he questions Adrian about her motives. She orders him back to the lake and to stay away from Lavery. As far as the next woman in my life is concerned, it's everything or nothing. Then it better be nothing. Phone me from the lake. Sure. And remember, stay away from Lavery. Sure. Based on their angry conversation, Adrian tells Marlow that he would be crazy to fall in love with her. Wait, when did that happen? Marlow goes directly to Lavery's house in Bay City. When no one answers the door, he lets himself inside. He sees two glasses on the table. Suddenly, a woman comes down the stairs. 
She has a gun in her hand and is complaining about the sloppy condition of the house. Finally, she says she is the landlady and is named Fallbrook. She says she found the gun on the stairs and gives it to Marlowe. She also says she has searched the whole house. Mrs. Fallbrook starts to call the police, but Marlowe talks her out of it. Marlowe says he is from the finance company and she believes him. She gets a little giggly and flirty before leaving. Oh, what about the gun? Well, I'll give it to Lavery when he comes home. Well, if you think that that... Oh, I'm sure it is, Mrs. Fallbrook. Now, you be a good girl and do everything you have to do. <laughs> Silly man. No, you're sweet. Thank you, Mrs. Fallbrook. <laughs> Bye now. Marlowe goes upstairs and finds a lady's handkerchief monogrammed with AF. He then finds Lavery murdered in the shower. It seems Lavery has been dead for some time. He wonders if Adrian is behind the killing with the drinks, the handkerchief, and the order to stay away. Marlowe storms into the Christmas party at Kingsby's office. They all stop and look at him as if he was wearing fur. Marlowe and Adrian go to Kingsby's office to talk. Adrian chews Marlowe out for being indiscreet. Marlowe gives Adrian the gun and tells her that Lavery is dead. He shows her the handkerchief. She denies killing Lavery. Marlowe questions her motives again. Kingsby comes in and Marlowe tells that Lavery is dead and wants to know if his wife owns a gun. Did your wife own a gun, Mr. Kingsby? What does my wife have to do with this? Break it to him gently. Derry. I hired Mr. Marlowe to try and find Crystal. You didn't. Yes, I thought... You had no right to meddle. Crystal is to be left alone, to do what she wants to do. I've told you that. No, you didn't. What you said was you were tired to death of her. Well, I... Oh, you're not. Well, why didn't you say so? I won't have you prying into my private affairs. Adrian tells Kingsby that she hired Marlowe to find Crystal. Kingsby becomes indignant, saying she had no right to hire someone to look for his wife. Marlowe's plan is to put the gun back and call the police. Kingsby offers Marlowe $1,000 to drop it. Kingsby then says that he wants nothing to do with Adrian. She chews on Marlowe for messing up her million-dollar sugar daddy. She then says she is not falling in love with Marlowe and will find another sugar daddy. Kingsby catches Marlowe on the way out. He hires Marlowe and now wants Marlowe to find Crystal. He says he will pay Marlowe to keep Crystal out of the Lavery murder. Kingsby says the killer might be Adrian. The scene switches to the Lavery house where Captain Kane is chewing on Marlowe for handling the gun. Marlowe tells about Mrs. Fallbrook. Lieutenant DeGarment says Lavery was a player and that the murder looks like it was committed by a woman. Marlowe says that he is working for Kingsby and looking for Crystal. He also tells about Muriel Chess being drowned in the lake. Captain Kane wants to know who Marlowe is trying to frame. Later, Marlowe asks Lieutenant DeGarment why he showed interest when the killing at the lake was mentioned. He also says that a tough cop was looking for Mildred Haviland earlier at the lake. He continues that Mildred Haviland and Muriel Chess are the same person. Lieutenant DeGarment slaps Marlowe repeatedly. Lieutenant DeGarment warns Marlowe to stay away. When DeGarment draws back to hit Marlowe, Marlowe hits first. They arrest Marlowe. Marlowe is in Captain Kane's office with Lieutenant DeGarment. Lieutenant DeGarment wants to beat the information out of Marlowe, but Captain Kane stops him and gives him the night off. A cop brings him proof that Marlowe had an alibi during the time of the killing. Mrs. Fallbrook is in Las Vegas. Since it is Christmas Eve, Captain Kane gets a phone call from his daughter. Marlowe tells Captain Kane to ask Lieutenant DeGarment about knowing Mildred Haviland and Lavery. Marlowe says that this case has history and he plans on finding it out. Finally, Captain Kane lets Marlowe go. Marlowe goes into the press room to call the night editor of a newspaper. He requests all the information on Mildred Haviland. Lieutenant DeGarment is in the hallway giving him the stink eye. Marlowe goes back to his apartment and Adrian shows up. She says that she would never kill anyone. I wouldn't kill anyone, Marlowe. No, just a nice, clean campfire girl. I'm all mixed up tonight, I... It turns out that you are the little girl who held the hot and smoking pistol. You're going to be really mixed up. You think I'm that vicious? Yes. I thought you liked me. The girl I like won't be editing a string of crime magazines, or looking for a quick million bucks, or trying to hang a murder on another woman. Marlowe says his woman will only have the job of taking care of him. 
The night editor calls and Marlowe sends Adrian away. She gives her phone number as she leaves. The night editor says Mildred Haviland was involved in the suicide of the wife of a man she was nursing in Bay City. The night editor also says that the dead woman's parents thought it was murder, but they had been forced by someone, read Lieutenant DeGarment, to clam up. Marlowe goes to Bay City to see the parents of the suicide victim, Eugene Grayson, Morris Ancrum, and Mrs. Grayson, Kathleen Lockhart. They are as nervous as a sore-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. They refuse to help, say that Lieutenant DeGarment has just left. Marlowe says that their daughter was murdered by Mildred Haviland, and Lieutenant DeGarment covered it up. He leaves the house. Marlowe sees a suspicious car on the other side of the street. The car pulls in behind him as he drives away. The driver of the following car uses his spotlight to force Marlowe to wreck his car. After Marlowe wrecks, Lieutenant DeGarment pours booze all over the passed out man and leaves the bottle. Marlowe returns to the current timeline and tells that Lieutenant DeGarment called the police on him, but he woke up before the cops came. A drunk finds him and tries to steal his wallet. Marlowe slugs the drunk and leaves the man in the car. He also leaves his identification with the man as they didn't have pictures on him at the time. The injured Marlowe makes it to a phone booth where he calls Adrian to pick him up before he passes out. The cops come and arrest the drunk and book him as Marlowe. Marlowe wakes up in bed at Adrian's apartment. She says the doorman brought him up. Adrian brings him a mirror to look at his bangs and bruises. She treats his wounds with antiseptic and bandages him. Marlowe can't figure out how Lieutenant DeGarment knew who he would visit. Adrian pitches that she and Marlowe become a couple. He would write and she would edit. I'd be a private detective at all. Why eat? You only get hungry again. You don't have to make a living that way. You're a writer. I could help you write. I know all the, the little tricks. We'd be fine together. In everything, we'd be fine together if only you just... Just what? I don't know. I, you don't think I'm honest. I want you to know that I am. It's that... Well, I... I've been a long time wanting things thinking I wanted things. Adrian says she wants the job of taking care of Marlowe. Marlowe asks if she killed Lavery. She denies that she did. They state their love and devotion to each other. On Christmas morning, Marlowe is wearing a new men's robe. In the pocket is a card showing it was a gift intended for Kingsby. Marlowe admires himself in the mirror. Adrian confesses that she bought it for Kingsby. She makes breakfast for the pair. Marlowe is still worried about who murdered Lavery. He's also worried that when they find out they have arrested a drunk, Lieutenant DeGarment will come looking to kill Marlowe. The pair hangs around the apartment listening to Christmas stories on the radio. Adrian gives her life story. The buzzer on the door rings, but they don't answer it. It keeps ringing, and it turns out to be Kingsby. Kingsby is looking for Marlowe. He says the Bay City Police are looking for Marlowe, and two detectives have followed him to Adrian's apartment. Kingsby has gotten a call from his wife, who is in Bay City. She says the cops are after her, and she needs money. Kingsby can't go because the detectives are following him. He tells Marlowe that he will pay $5,000 for the job. Adrian doesn't want Marlowe to see Crystal. Marlowe accuses her of trying to keep him off the case. Marlowe tells Adrian to give him 10 minutes with Crystal and then come in with Captain Kane and some cops. His plan is to get Crystal to take him to her hiding place. He plans on leaving a trail of rice on the street. How'd that work out for Hansel and Gretel? Marlowe drives to Bay City in Adrian's car. He goes to the bar where Crystal is waiting, wearing Kingsby's scarf. The lady keeps her back turned and demands the money. Marlowe says they have to go to her hiding place. She leads him down the street as he leaves a rice trail. Inside Crystal's room, the lady turns around. She is holding a gun in her pocket and is the lady that said she was Mrs. Fallbrook in the Lavery place. She had come back to the murder location looking for money. Marlowe calls the woman Mildred Haviland. She denies killing Lavery. She denies killing the lady in Bay City. She denies killing Crystal Kingsby. You shot Lavery, didn't you? No, I didn't. Wait a minute. You don't think I actually believe you're Crystal Kingsby, do you? Mr. Kingsby believed it when you talked to him on the phone, though, didn't he, Mildred? You're Mildred Haviland. You murdered the Almore woman. I didn't. She was asphyxiated in her car. It was an accident. The lady in the lake, instead of being you, is Crystal Kingsby. Is that an accident? Yes. 
Yes, yes, it was. Yes, Crystal and I traded clothes one night, and she had on my things and I had on hers. We went across the lake to see if we could fool my husband, Bill Chess. That was my husband. And Crystal fell in the lake and sank to the bottom, huh? Yes. The latter is the lady in the lake. Mildred says the most recent two deaths were accidents. Marlowe takes the gun away from Mildred because the safety is on. Mildred switches into a desperate female that needs a man's help. Oh, I'm frightened. I'm so frightened. Get me out of here. Please, please. Please get me out of here. Take me with you. Take me with you anywhere. I bet that went big with Lavery. Please. It went big with DeGamo, too, didn't it? Marlowe doesn't bite, asking if that's how she got Lavery and DeGarment to do her bidding. There is a knock on the door, and it turns out to be Lieutenant DeGarment with his gun drawn. He socks Marlowe to the ground, and Mildred starts ranting for DeGarment to kill Marlowe. Get him with that gun. Kill him. Kill him. Hello, honey. Aren't you going to speak to me, honey? Oh, don't look so surprised. That wasn't me that fell in the lake. That was... He doesn't like you anymore, Mildred. Oh, yes, he does, don't you, honey? You, you weren't expecting him, were you? He was expecting the other cops, honey, not you. He's going to kill you, Mildred. Marlowe says that he doesn't love her anymore, and he will kill her. Lieutenant DeGarment says people have to be protected from people like her. Marlowe lobbies Lieutenant DeGarment to arrest Mildred. DeGarment says he will clean up after tonight. Mildred begs for her life, but Lieutenant DeGarment shoots her with her own gun. <coughs> Lieutenant DeGarment tells Marlowe that he followed the rice because Adrian tipped him off. At last, Captain Kane and a group of cops arrive. Lieutenant DeGarment tries to shoot Captain Kane, but Kane fires first and kills him. Marlowe IDs the dead woman as Mildred Haviland. In present time, Marlowe tells that Lieutenant DeGarment overheard Adrian telling Captain Kane about the rice trick. Adrian comes in and they kiss. They have tickets to head to New York. Conclusion Raymond Chandler, the novel's author, was hired to write the screenplay. When Chandler heard that Montgomery was using a subjective camera or point of view, he had his name removed from the script writing credits. This Christmas movie is listed as being released in 1946. It was released in the United Kingdom in late December 1946. However, it did not premiere in the United States until January 19, 1947. It was believed that the film was to be released at Christmas time in 1946, but was delayed as it was deemed not family friendly. Crystal Kingsby was never shown in the film as the character was already dead in the lake. However, Crystal Kingsby is listed as being played by Ella Mort in the credits. This is an inside joke as Ella Mort is a phonetic version of the French phrase Ella es morte or she is dead. This point of view film led to Audrey Totter being on the screen a lot of the time. She was great in this film and is often cited as one of the best femme fatales based on this role. However, they made a happy ending and let her off the hook at the film's end. Was she a femme fatale? World famous short summary. P.I. is not sure if his girlfriend is the killer and doesn't care. This show is now completely free and independent, brought to you without ads. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcast. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, References and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. Beware the Moors.